if we disregard the portrait, where the problem is more complicated owing to the purely individual theme, single elements in works of fine art or of literature will not convey an impression of either truth or falsehood, in isolation they stand outside these categories. Or looking at the matter from the other side, the artist is free as regards initial elements from which the work of art emerges, only after he has chosen a character, a style, an element of color and form, an atmosphere, do the other parts become predetermined. They have now to meet the expectations aroused by the first step, which may be fantastic, arbitrary, and unreal. So long as the elaboration is harmonious and consistent, the whole will produce an Impression of inner truth, whether or not an individual part corresponds to outward reality and satisfies the claim to truth in the ordinary and substantial sense. Truth in a work of art means that as a whole it keeps the promise which one part has, as it were, voluntarily offered us. It may be any one part, since the mutual correspondence of the parts gives the quality of truth to each of them. Truth is therefore also a relative concept in the particular context of art. It is realized as a relationship between the elements of a work of art, and not as an exact correspondence between the elements and an external object which constitutes the absolute norm. If the apprehension of an object means to apprehend it as a unity, it also means to apprehend it in its necessity. There is a profound relationship between these two things. Necessity is a relation through which the heterogeneity of two elements becomes a unity. The formula of necessity is, if A exists, so does B. This necessary relation states that A and B are the elements of A particular unit of being or occurrence, and necessary relation signifies a completely coherent relation, which is only decomposed and reconstituted by language. The unity of a work of art is obviously exactly the same as this necessity since it develops by the mutual conditioning of the different elements, one of which follows necessarily if another is given, and vice versa. Necessity is a phenomenon of relations not only with reference to interrelated things, but in itself and according to its concept. Neither of the two most general categories that are the basis of our knowledge of the world, being, and laws, contains necessity. The existence of real life is not necessary in terms of any law, it would not contradict any logical or natural law if nothing existed. It is also not necessary that natural laws exist, they are mere facts, just as being is a mere fact, and only so far as they exist are the events subjected to them necessary. There can be no natural law that natural laws must exist. What we call necessity exists only as a relation between being and laws it is the form of their relation. Both are realities that are strictly independent of each other, for being is conceivable without being subject to laws, and the system of laws would be just as valid even if there were no corresponding being. Only if both exist do the forms of being become subject to necessity, being and laws are the elements of unity, which we cannot apprehend directly but only through the relation of necessity. This unity binds together being and laws, it is inherent in neither. One separately, but rules exist only because laws exist and give meaning and significance to the laws only because being exists. From another aspect, bearing upon the same question, relativism with reference to the principles of perception may be formulated in the following way. The constitutive principles that claim to express once and 
For all, the essence of objects are transposed into regulated principles, which are only points of view in the progress of knowledge. The final, highest abstractions, simplifications, and syntheses of thought have to renounce the dogmatic claim to be the ultimate judgments in the realm of knowledge. The assertion that things behave in a determinate way has to be replaced, in the context of the most developed and general views, by the notion that our understanding must proceed as if things behave in such and such a way. This makes it possible to express adequately the manner and method of our understanding in its real relation to the world. There corresponds with and originates in the many-sidedness of our being and the one-sidedness of any conceptual expression regarding our relation to things. The fact that no such expression is universally and permanently satisfactory, but is usually complemented historically by an opposite assertion. This produces, in many instances, an undetermined wavering, a contradictory mixture, or a disinclination to adopt any comprehensive principles. If the constitutive assertions that aim to establish the essence of things are changed into heuristic assertions that seek only to determine our methods of attaining knowledge by formulating ideal ends, this makes possible the simultaneous validity of opposing principles. If there Significance is only methodological, they may be used alternatively without contradiction, there is no contradiction in changing from the inductive to the deductive method. The true unity of apprehension is secured only by such a dissolution of dogmatic rigidity into the living and moving process. Its ultimate principles become realized not in the form of mutual exclusion but in the form of mutual dependence, mutual evocation and mutual complementation. Thus, for example, the development of the metaphysical worldview moves between the unity and the multiplicity of the absolute reality in which all particular perceptions are based. The nature of our thinking is such that we strive for each of them as a definite conclusion without being able to settle upon either. Only when all the differences and variety of things are reconciled in a single aggregate is the intellectual and emotional striving for unity satisfied. However, as soon as this unity is attained, as in the concept of substance by Spinoza, it becomes clear that there is nothing one can do with it in understanding the world and that a second principle at least is necessary in order to make it fruitful. Monism leads on to dualism or to pluralism, but they again create a desire for unity, and so the development of philosophy, and of individual thinking, moves from multiplicity to unity and from unity to multiplicity.